My name is Paul Knotts Clark. I'm the principal of a small organization called the ADAPT Initiative. Um, what the initiative does is work to raise the uh, profile of the climate crisis towards humanitarian organizations. Um, I understand from yesterday's conversation that not a lot of profile raising is needed here, but you would be surprised um, that it isn't uh, high on many organizations' lists of, of to-do lists. Uh, and also, and I think probably as if not more importantly, we work with quite a wide variety of stakeholders to develop programmatic and policy solutions to uh, some of the challenges of climate change. Um, so in the next 15 minutes, uh, I'd like to outline the ways in which uh, I think climate will affect our humanitarian work and some of the consequences, what that might mean for the humanitarian system and for our organizations moving forward. Um, yeah, I don't think it needs saying, but uh, as, as a kind of uh, starting point, um, the land temperature in the world is currently uh, on average about 1.1 degrees Celsius over the average temperature before the Industrial Revolution. Um, and uh, most forecasts suggest it will be plus 1.5 by 2035 at the latest. Uh, and these are quite small numbers. They also, however, um, are the highest average temperatures for 125,000 years, which means that all human recorded history, civilization, agriculture, culture, technology beyond stone tools, everything that we ever have achieved as a species is now history. We are leaving that behind. We are in entirely uncharted waters. Um, and that, of course, will have very broad ramifications for many, many aspects of all of our lives. But professionally, it has very significant aspects for the humanitarian endeavor. Climate change is going to change our work, uh, our humanitarian work, in three major ways. It will change the scale of crises. It will change the nature of crises and it will undermine the resilience of people affected by these crises and make it harder for them to survive when crises hit. So let's take a look at these three areas in turn, starting with scale. The AR6 report of the IPCC makes it clear that the period from 2020 to 2035, so now and the next decade, are a period of phase transition with respect to natural disasters or weather-related emergencies. We are moving very rapidly, and I think anyone, you know, we're all aware of this, we're all looking at newspapers. Um, we are moving very rapidly from uh, into a new situation of bigger, more frequent disasters. And, and we can see that in Australia, we can see that in, uh, in California, in Pakistan, in Germany, just over the last 12 months. Um, this will particularly be the case for flooding because a warmer world is a wetter world uh, and for tropical storms, which are likely to become much more intense, although actually the number of storms won't necessarily increase. But it's not just the weather hazards that we need to con consider from a humanitarian perspective. We also need to consider distress migration. Now, the, the relationship between migration and climate change is complex. Uh, and very locally specific. But essentially what we can say is that in many places, climate factors combine with the other pre-existing drivers of migration to amplify what is going on already. Often this is rural to urban internal migration rather than migration across borders. So something like a doubling of current levels of displacement, and remember that levels of displacement are at an extreme historical high, is entirely possible in the fairly near future. It's very hard to predict with accuracy, but that would be a good kind of number to work with. The third way in which climate will increase the scale of suffering relates to conflict. And again, the evidence around climate conflict is, is, is fairly unclear, um, but it doesn't seem at the moment that climate is driving large scale, at least large scale international armed conflict. Uh, what it is doing is two things. It's making existing conflicts worse. And critically for humanitarians, 
it's making it harder for people to survive the it, when they are already in conflict situations. So really what we should see climate change as at the moment is a really lethal second front in many of the conflicts where we're working, which interacts with and magnifies the negative effects on vulnerable populations. And finally, we should note that none of the things that I've just said are instead of the existing humanitarian caseload. They're all as well as. Yeah. So we're really looking at a massive increase in the scale of humanitarian need. But as if that weren't enough, the impact is not just one of scale. It's also one of nature, and that in some ways may be more challenging for humanitarians. Um, firstly, many of these weather-related uh, disasters are becoming less predictable. So we're already seeing tropical storms generating much, much more quickly than they have in the past because of warmer uh, sea temperatures, um, which makes it more difficult to predict and to provide early warning. We're seeing tropical storms anecdotally in places where they haven't occurred before, and two of them following in the same track, which historically has been unusual. And the same sort of things are true for hazard events. For example, the Australian wildfires behaved very differently last time around from the way that they have in the past. So the things that we thought we know, we don't really know anymore. And the things that, and then there are things that we didn't really know, or humanitarians have very limited experience of dealing with. Uh, things like glacial lake outbursts, wildfires, and particularly, I want to underline this, heat waves. Um, and I want to underline heat waves as a new challenge for humanitarians, for many humanitarians, because I don't think that the impact, the potential impact of these heat waves has been fully understood. Um, Heat-related mortality in South Asia has increased by over 25% in just 20 years, uh, to the extent that in one city alone in 2015, 65,000 people were recorded as being hospitalized, recorded as being hospitalized um, as a result of one heat wave. Uh, 65,000 people. It's a big number, and that's not including all the people who weren't hospitalized or weren't recorded. But the chilling thing about that, chilling in the context of heat wave might not be quite right. Um, the, the chilling thing about that is this. At the time, uh, there was about a 7 or an 8% chance in any given year in 2015 of there being a heat wave in that, uh, that city, Karachi. Some projections fairly reliable projections, but some projections suggest that by 2035, there will be an almost 50% chance of that heat wave occurring in any given year. So you flip a coin, you've got a one in two chance. So this is a really big new humanitarian issue, particularly across a wide belt of South Asia and Central Asia. And finally, um, we're seeing more cascading crises. So this is the sort of COVID situation where multiple or one large global crisis or multiple uh, crises occurring at the same time have very unpredictable and rapid effects politically and economically well beyond um, the actual health or other crisis implications. And we can expect, according to the IPCC, to see many more of these because, of course, climate change is a global, not a local event. Did I mention there's not a lot of laughs in this uh, presentation? <laughs> um, the third element, as well as scale and nature, is decreased resilience. Um, it's not just the acute weather events that we need to worry about. It's also the fact that these events will be affecting people whose ability to survive them has been hugely degraded. Um, frequent disasters that we've just talked about, um, what some people are already saying in, in, in some parts of the world are perma crises, permanent states of crisis, will of course mean that these households have fewer assets uh, and less economic resilience. Um, and even without the crises degrading people's ability to survive, climate change will 
bring mass, the threat of mass food insecurity. In the next, in the next two decades, 10% of arable land is predicted to go out of cultivation. And much of that land is the land where humanitarians work, the, the semi-arid areas where we work. Um, and for those farmers who keep their land or livestock, yields and the nutritional value of their crops are likely to decrease. So we have less resilience through food security, less resilience through assets, uh, and with respect to health, uh, far less potentially resilience, because as well as the health impacts of the disasters, we will also see, as a result of increased temperatures, increased incidence of waterborne diseases and changes to the range and seasonalities of vector-borne diseases such as malaria and dengue. So taking all of these things together, the sector, to recap, We'll see populations with even poorer health and nutritional status than they currently have being affected by frequent large scale interconnected disasters that we find difficult to predict. And the impact of these will be particularly powerful in fragile and conflict affected states. So the question was, is the humanitarian architecture ready for that? Well, the answer is no. Um, but there isn't a simple solution. And it might be that the architecture that we've created since, particularly since the 1960s, just isn't up to the job, that, you know, the world is going to come up with some other way, have to come up with some other way of doing it. But it's clear that change is required across the board. Um, briefly, change is required in terms of what humanitarians do. We've got to move away from immediate response model. At the moment, over 90% of the money goes to post disaster or post-crisis response, there will not be enough money for that model to work. So this requires humanitarians working, as many, many of you have been trying to do anyway, but there are financial constraints, along the, the disaster management spectrum from uh, DRR through preparedness response, anticipation response, reconstruction. In terms of who the humanitarians are, Working in these new ways is going to mean working intensively with new partners, with climate scientists, with MET departments, with insurance companies, with credit institutions, with social welfare planners. And it'll often mean humanitarians playing a fairly small role in large and complex teams, which has not necessarily been a humanitarian strength in the past, stepping back uh, and allowing others to lead. And part of this playing a small role uh, will be recognizing that international organizations cannot be everywhere all the time, have access challenges, and are not structured to deal with chronic emergencies uh, of this nature. And we need to finally follow up the rhetoric and let local societies and local structures lead. Sorry. How? Uh, as we expand more into areas of resilience, we'll be working with mechanisms and approaches that aren't part of traditional work. And I'm thinking here about much more on sort of the resilience of health systems, much more of integration of humanitarian cash into social welfare programs, um, much more around risk sharing financial instruments. And this is going to require a lot more innovation, a lot more process innovation than the sector currently demonstrates. And in the area of response, because response will remain an important part of what we do, just not all of what we do, we're going to have to become more flexible and more adaptive to deal with these complex situations. Now, actually, the scorecard on COVID for humanitarians were pretty good. So we know that it can be done. Uh, it's just, are we really designing our organizations to optimize that adaptiveness and that flexibility? And finally, we'll need to work out how all of this is going to be paid for because humanitarian funding currently covers, as you know, less than 60% of assessed humanitarian needs. So there's absolutely no way that the existing funding streams can stretch to cover these additional massive needs. And there is everything to play for, I think, in terms of the current discussions around climate financing, around the nexus, and around engaging with development financing as well. And here I would say, that the catalytic role of private funding rather than public funding can be extremely important in showing that new approaches are possible. In sum, 
The environment we live in is changing extremely quickly. And as a direct result of this, we've moved out of the environmental conditions which all human history has taken place within. This will call for changes in all areas of life. It will mean huge changes in humanitarian work if that work is to be successful. We don't have a very good record of change in the humanitarian system, but we also don't have much of a choice. I would suggest that in every organization represented here, somewhere there are the seeds of this change. There are things that you are already doing uh, which will work um, because that's how change often happens in the system. Uh, it begins with the concrete activities on the ground that are solving practical problems and you're already doing that. Um, all I would say is that there's not much time, so we better really get our skates on. Thank you. I'd be very happy to talk about any of this. Here is my email address. Thank you.